Okay, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of the All Gear No Game, you know, with the big Jonah, big Willie Willard up in How's here. How's it going? <laughs> Happy to okay. be back. Huh? Yes, sir. Um, So, first of all, we kind of want to break down, or I'll break down and then Jonah will chime in, because Jonah was busy man today. He was playing, he went, played nine. He killed it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So I'll just give my predictions for the upcoming Till vs. Whitaker fights, which are going to be absolutely. It's. I. I really hope that the Till vs. Whitaker fight is going to be a banger because both of these guys are head hunters. But at the beginning, I'll start off. I didn't write who Paul Craig was fighting. He's the first. Uh, I'm just going to talk about like the first five fights because that's usually like the main card, obviously. So I picked Paul Craig because. Um, to be honest, I don't even know, really. I haven't even seen a lot of these people fight. But uh, I looked at Paul Craig's record, and I think he's beat a few good guys. Let me see. Um, He beat... Let me see. Oh, yeah, he went, uh, he went a draw with Shogun Rua, who is the like co-main event of this fight, and he's really good. But... I don't know. He doesn't have too good of. He's a big dude, but he hasn't. He doesn't have too good of a resume. So it's just so hard to follow. We literally just said this. It's so hard to follow everybody. But okay, moving on to the Marina Rodriguez versus Carla Sparza. That fight's gonna. I'm actually looking forward to that fight because Carla Sparza is on a three fight dub streak, and she's beat wow. some. She's beat some top top of the line fighters like she. She beat, uh, oh yeah, she beat Miss Michelle Watterson and Alexa Grasso, who are like studs in the, I think they are, yeah, straw weight division. Like those are top of the line competitors. And so to, to me, like this fight's a hella toss up because um, Car- uh, Marina Rodriguez has a uh, good wins. She's beaten Tisha Torres who's like a freaking hurricane. But I was actually looking at Tisha Torres' record. She lost like five fights in a row or something, but they threw her to like the wolves, like the people that she's lost to. So beating her is actually a a pretty big win because she's more mid-level. But Marina Rodriguez versus Carlos Barz is going to be fireworks, and I have no idea who's going to win, though. Can I chime in for a second? Yeah. I feel like, from what I've seen so far, like the women fights often I feel like tend to be toss-ups more like they're harder to predict because i feel like you see a lot of submissions in those fights like arm bars and leg bars and <laughs> yeah and it, and it feels like you just kind of have to get lucky in order to get one of them well not really lucky but like you could like be losing the entire fight and then get like a leg bar in like the mm-hmm. third round and win. yeah exactly um and then also for Marina, Marina, she's fought Cynthia, Cynthia Calvillo, who beat Jessica I. I'm pretty sure her last time out, and she's a she's an absolute beast. And so, I I really have no idea who's gonna freaking win this fight. I, I think it, honestly it could end up being one of the better fights, just because both of these fighters are have won a lot recently. So I'm looking forward to that one a lot. Um, but yeah, Marina Rodriguez with wins over Tisha Torres and Cynthia Calvillo. That's pretty impressive. Um, and then moving on to the third fight on the main card, you've got Alexander Gustafson versus um, Fabricio Verdum. And Alexander Gustafson is pretty much the biggest lock on this one because even though he's like making his debut at – the light heavy, I mean, at the heavyweight division, Fabricio over Doom, he's on the wrong side of 40. Alexander's 33. He's really athletic. He's a dynamic striker. He's fought with, um, he, he sparred and fought with heavyweights before. He's not scared of him. He's just a big Viking. And Fabricio over Doom basically got the crap beat out of him for three rounds against an older heavyweight who's not necessarily top of the line talent. And although Fabricio over Doom is a former champion, he, I just don't know if he's got it in him anymore, you know? Did you say he's 40 years old? Over 40. He's like 42. Over. Dang, that's crazy. Yeah. 
How old are like the oldest UFC fighters? Well, I'm pretty, that pretty much as old as it gets. Once once you hit about I think people can people compete in MMA for a while. Like you can move to different um you can definitely move to different promotions and stuff. Yeah. But as for competing at the highest level in MMA and in the UFC, you've if you're not if if you're about over forty two, it's about it's time to call it quits. Unless you're I don't know, finding some sort of peak in performance like Daniel Cormier is, but there's so few guys that have that much athleticism to be able to keep up with young hungry competitors. And yeah. there's a lot more longevity in the in the heavyweight division for some reason, which is weird to think about considering the fact that that's the hardest hitting division in the sport. But you hear about people saying like he's he's heavyweight young or whatever, and so you could be 36 or 37 and still be fine at heavyweight, which is weird. The uh, old man strength starts to kick <laughs> in. Everything. Yeah, exactly. And then Shogun Rua versus. Um, Rogerio Noguera, I think. I always get. I didn't even know Rogerio even existed, but because I only heard of his brother Minotaro Noguera, oh, that's his nickname or something. And yeah, he's really old. He's forty four. Rogerio is forty four. Shogun's thirty eight. He's not like a spring chicken or whatever, but like he is definitely has the edge and resume. He's fought like the best guys. He's fought like. Leota Machida, John Jones, Alexander Gustafson, stuff like that. So I'm definitely going to have to give the edge to Shogun just because of his resume, even though both of them are definitely on a rapid decline because of age. I'm pretty sure he's fought. Yeah, he's fought Gustafson. He's, he's fought really good. Shogun's fought really good guys, but he's mostly lost to them. So I don't know. He's, he's really good. And then as for the main event of the evening Robert Whitaker and Darren Till is going to be sick as hell like you because they're both headhunters and they just go hard and Robert Whitaker is like one of the toughest dudes in the UFC so I think and Darren Till has only lost twice and he's a young buck and he was at 170 and then he moved up to 185 because it's a more comfortable weight class for him so both of these guys whoever wins this is probably either going to fight Jack or Manson the guy that won last week and then, or they're gonna fight for the title. I think yeah. that, yeah, it would be exciting to see him fight Jack because of like how good Jack looked last time. Like, yeah, exactly. So Israel Adesanya and Paulo Costa are fighting for the um, middleweight title in August, and then Jack Hermanson's basically in line for that and then the winner of this one because robert whitaker just <laughs> just was that a strong was that a strong swig right there no <laughs> no but i, I think i'm gonna mess up the podcast juice a little bit huh? it was a little bit too heavy <laughs> <laughs> i could tell it looked like you're like mm. <laughs> but yeah rob was he he basically i think he did fine i didn't watch the fight i watched the highlights of it but israel basically he, he knocked him out it, it was in the second round, I think, which was pretty, it was a pretty decisive win. But if Robert wins, I can see him fighting Jack or Manson. But since Darren Till has so much star power, I can definitely f- see him um, maybe leapfrogging Jack and going to the title and having like Robert be, uh, have like Robert face Jack and then Till versus the winner of Costa versus Adesanya for the championship, for the title. So, but you think like to, um, this fight will be one where we see the guys on their feet for like most of yeah, hundred and ten percent. Yeah, those are the best ones too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Darren Till, Muay Thai guy, and then uh, Robert Whitaker. He's just he's just a really tough. He just stand and bang with you all day. Yeah. Um, he. He had, you know, UL, he fought like two fights with UL Romero and like arguably lost one of them. Like, but both of those fights were super exciting and people were just at the point where they're like, I just want to see those guys fight every time. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. But I think this is the last fight on Fight Island and then they're moving back to Vegas. But I don't even know if Vegas is going to ha- happen. Like, 
Yeah, it doesn't knows. seem possible. Who knows? Because stuff's just getting worse. Do they have a backup plan in place, like for Vegas? Yeah, I'm sure they have something up their sleeve for sure. Because there are so many like UFC gyms in the U.S., I feel like it would be easy to just hold them at some other gym in the meantime, right? Mm-hmm, for sure. Because like the Apex is the Apex, what they call the one in Vegas, right? Yeah. And like that one's cool because of like the stands and stuff and can fit mm-hmm. a lot of fans. But if there are no fans, it doesn't like really matter where yeah. you hold them that much. Yeah. Um, I think, but the Apex, I feel like should be fine since it's their main deal. Yeah. And they, can, like, and they can control who comes in and out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But that's that. That's the UFC. So do you want to move into, um, do you want to talk about golf actually a little bit? Yeah, we can. Um, right. So did you watch any of it on a Sunday? To see John Rollins pull it off? No, I didn't. I just followed it on my phone, kind of. Can we uh, talk about Bryson, though? Bryson's meltdown on Friday. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. Talk about it. So, Bryson is just... I don't... I pride myself in not disliking too many people. But Bryson (laughs) is somebody who I just cannot stand. And I don't even mean that in a bad way, because... Obviously, oh, how can you not mean that? Way? Sports, sports are something where you need a villain. Like it's always fun to have a guy you love to hate, and I love to hate Bryson DeChambeau. <laughs> so, last Friday, for those of you I guess who are not watching the PGA tournament, Bryson sent not one but two three woods out of bounds on a par five, and now the first three wood was nestled up against the fence that marked the out-of-bounds in a way that provided some ambiguity as to whether or not the ball had actually passed the border off of the course and into somebody's backyard. And so Bryson does what I think most golfers would do and called over a rules official. And the rules official told Bryson that the ball was out of bounds and now it's important to remember that the rules officials aren't just like some old guy who's like following the group and keeping track of their scores like the rules officials every tournament has like two or three or probably more like four or five rules officials and these guys know their stuff like they travel with the pga tour every week and their only job is to like provide rulings when they're asked to so these guys obviously know the rules of golf. They probably know it even better than Bryson. And so the first rules official told Bryson, this ball's out of bounds, man. And Bryson did not respond very well to that. <laughs> but he was like, he just said, oh, okay, thank you. And then he called over another rules official because he was not fond of the ruling he got the first time. The second, Wait, I think that I can share the screen and I could like play it. Do you want to? That yeah, would be cool. I think I can share screen. Share the screen. And then go um, to Safari. Share. Uh, I don't know how to do this. Okay, oh, can so you see my screen? No. No, you can't. I can't see it. But it's okay. Continue with your story. I'll just try to figure this out really fast. Okay, yeah. So anyway, the second rules official comes over. And basically tells Bryson the exact same thing. And that's when Bryson just starts throwing a tantrum and trying to provide an analogy to Phil Mickelson's ball earlier this year at the Arnold Palmer Invitational that had gotten caught in a fence. And he just keeps arguing with this guy. And eventually, the guy, like, eventually Bryson just realizes it's pointless to keep arguing and storms off. And so he ends up getting a 10 on his hole, on this hole. And that, basically seals his fate like obviously it was a trunk slam week for bryson and Mm -hmm. so he was frustrated and then the very very next hole bryson is walking down the fairway after he hit a fine drive and the camera's following him and you just see his caddy walk up to the camera just step in front of the camera and block bryson (laughs) out of the camera's view and it's just like Brother, you are in the ring. Like <laughs> you are on the you are inside the ropes of the PGA tour, which is being broadcast on Golf Channel across America. Like you don't get to make the decision 
of whether or not you're being shown on TV. Like that decision, you made that decision when you signed up for this. So when he acts like, when he acts like the television managers or the film crew are the bad guys for like showing him when he's frustrated like he has no idea what what his job is and yeah that's so dumb i know he literally hates that he doesn't like to be portrayed as a bad guy but it's mm-hmm. good though for people to see that because you want to see how someone truly acts yeah and bryson has got to be one of the least self-aware people in <laughs> professional sports like how do you not want to be portrayed as the bad guy and then do all of this crap that just makes you seem like a total piece of turd. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know he, he's, he's something. And it's not like I'm, it's like, I don't like him. It's not like I'm not going to bet him or not going to play him in fantasy. Cause obviously like mm-hmm. he's pretty freaking good, but golly, do I hate the guy. And so, yeah, no. Yeah. He's definitely, he's, He's a very confident young man, and he doesn't want to be portrayed as something that he's not. He's so intelligent. Or he doesn't want to be portrayed as something as that he is. No, yeah, yeah, that he that he that he is. Yes, you're right. You're right. So, so anyway, shout out to John Rom, another guy who I'm not particularly fond of. He wound up winning the tournament, which was good. I didn't have John Rom on my betting card this week, so this is the third straight week where we didn't have a winner and <laughs> and so it's been a bit of a dry spell but those happen yeah and <laughs> so this week we move on to the 3m open in minnesota and i'm sure you noticed last week there were a lot of big names in the field right like tiger was there rory was there brooks kepka yes was there so have you watched uh, stranger things before no i never got into it like i never really got into it so like do you know who the characters are though um e, kind yeah, so of basically last the boys there's like four boys and a girl yeah last week i would compare the tournament or the field of the tournament to nancy who is the brother of will who gets stuck in the upside down like it was a pretty like attractive field of players like you had a lot of like exciting names in there like it was pretty good this week is more like barbara or nancy's friend barbara the kind of (laughs) girl with the short curly red hair and freckles like this is probably one of the worst events we're gonna have all (laughs) so you at the top you've got some good names you've got brooks kepka you've got your dustin johnson's yeah. But then when you go down the board, it starts to look more and more like a corn fairy tour event. After that, like what does the, that mean? So corn fairy tour is basically like the my the minor leagues of golf. Oh. So like so when I if, I if I say like something's like a corn fairy tour event, it means that the players who are competing this week are not that good. But that said, like obviously I'm still gonna make some picks there. Obviously, like there's still a card, there's still some guys i like so i might just get like straight to that they're playing in um obviously like i said in minnesota the 3m 3m open it's going to be the opposite of what we saw last week at the memorial the memorial was very hard like you did not see guys going low obviously john Rahm went pretty low but there were a lot of bogeys a lot of big numbers like double bogeys even triple bogeys we even had a uh, paul casey and Bryson DeChambeau make quintuple quintuple bogeys, which is <laughs> when you go five over par on a single hole. That's not really going to be happening this week. This is sort of, I guess I would have to say like a resort style course. So basically, yeah. like obviously when you go to a resort, there's like a variety of people staying there, right? Because like families go on vacations and stuff. Mm-hmm. There. And so resort courses tend to be very easy because there's just like a wide range of people who want to play. So yeah. they have like wide fairways and the rough is not very, very penile. Um, there, another characteristic though, is there's a lot of water. Cause like usually resorts are in like a place where they like have like beautiful scenery and stuff. And like 
Water is obviously one of those things that are considered to make golf courses beautiful. So there's a lot of water here, but you have to go pretty far out of your way to get it there. Yeah. So I expect this to be back to what we saw before the Memorial, where we had a bunch of high scoring tournaments where guys would just go super low. We're probably going to see the winner back at like 24 or 22 under, like definitely, definitely back into the twenties. And so I might as well just go straight to who I think the winner will be. (laughs) Okay. I might just go down the betting board after that. So my winner for this week and my favorite play is none other than Will Gordon, the rookie out of, well, not even a rookie. This is his first year on tour, but not his rookie season, Will Gordon. So the thing about the 3M Open is last year we saw an exciting finish between three young golf superstars, Bryson DeChambeau, Colin Morikawa, and a Matthew Wolf. So yeah. this is from that group of field, for, or from that group of three players. We know this is a tournament that sets up to young guys who hit the ball far and are ball strikers. And that is what perfectly describes Will Gordon. Will Gordon is not the most consistent off the tee. Like he's mistake prone and that will not hurt him too much here, but he can hit the tits off the golf ball (laughs) and he can hit his irons too, which is important Mm -hmm. during a week where we expect the scores to be super low. Like, and by no means is Will Gordon even a favorite this week. He's, I'm going to do a quick fact check on okay. his odds, but I'm pretty sure I remember seeing him at even like 100 to 1. So he's still kind of flying under the radar. But from what we saw last year, this is a tournament where like young players tend to break out. And Will Gordon is, and now he's been bet all the way down to 66 to 1. And Will Gordon is one of those young guys who I think is like, He's already broken out, but I think he's primed to take the next step at yeah. literally any moment. And that's why I really like him this week. Um, so when we get into the top of the betting board, I like Dustin Johnson a lot too, just because Dustin Johnson in his career has on three different occasions won a tournament the week after he missed the cut. Obviously, he missed the cut. He missed the cut badly last week at the Memorial. I don't think that will phase him. I think this course will just be super easy for him. And I think this is one we could see Dustin win by like four or five shots just because he'll attack the par fives. He'll probably get a few eagles this week. I just think this is courses like somewhat beneath him. And so I think if if nothing else, he's a pretty safe bet to be in the top 10. When you go down one spot further to the second highest rated player in this field. I actually don't like Brooks Kepka. ever since the, like ever since the PGA tour has come back, he's been like super loose with his irons. <laughs> and last, last week, um, or not. Yeah. Last week after the Memorial had finished and he had a, not a terrible week. Like he made the cut, but it was still disappointing for Brooks Kepka. Mm. He like mentioned that his knee was bothering him, which like, you got to respect that. Like, it's good that he's being honest and like just telling us where he's at, but it's still sort of worrisome. And so I don't really trust Brooks Kepka. And so, yeah, that those are basically the two big names. After that, you've got Tony Finau, who I like Tommy Fleetwood, who is in his first tournament back since the tour restarted. And then you've got Paul Casey who missed the cut after getting an eight on a par three at the Memorial. And so I like Paul Casey, but not as much as Tony Fino and definitely not as much as DJ. And so when you get down further into the board, especially when you get into like the 8,000s on DraftKings, that's where you start to start to get into some sleepers that I really like. And probably the guy I like the most out of all of those is Eric Van Royen. And Eric's been playing pretty well since the tour came back. He's definitely been hitting his irons very nicely. And he's had a somewhat hot putter, which is not what we usually expect from Eric. But this is a course where if he's like, if he's like on his game and hitting fairways, 
which obviously, like I said, is easier when the fairways are like super generous here. He should be able to attack pins. And if he can keep making putts, I don't see any reason why he can, he can't win it. Like probably behind Will Gordon, I would say Eric Van Royen is my second pick to win it. So I like him a lot. Going down further is Ryan Moore. He's just another guy who shoots his irons and tends to do well in these sort of birdie fest type of tournaments. And then there's one more name I wanted to throw out who is way down the board. Almost, I think, here, let me double check for him too, but he might have even been 150. Let me see here. Yeah, all the way down at one at 100 to 1. And that is the Oregon boy, Aaron Wise. Aaron Wise is one of those guys who I think is somewhat underrated, but he also sort of does it to himself, you know? Like, he's got the game to compete at almost any tournament, especially a weaker tournament like this, but he's just so dang inconsistent, and he misses so many freaking cuts that, like, people and, like, odds makers have no choice but to just kind of overlook him. But when he's on, and he's shown some signs of life recently, like, Aaron Wise has won on the PGA Tour. Like, this is a kid who's taken Tiger Woods to 17 holes in a match play competition. Like he has the chops to compete with the best of the best. And this event is far from the best of the best. So I definitely think this is a course that sets up well to Wise's game. And if he can just somehow find a hot putter for this week, I think he could make some noise. Yeah. And so he would be my sleeper. So if I had to rank the five or if I had to rank my top three though, I would definitely go Will Gordon, Dustin Johnson, and then Eric Van Royen. But I also like I also like Aaron Wise, and I also like Harris English. <laughs> Dude, okay, you high key should like you need to become a golf announcer or something. Like you'd be honestly perfect for it. Thanks. Because you already have not like a quiet voice, but you have like really good analysis and you have like a calm voice and that would just be perfect for it. I feel like, and you know, you basically know everybody. Thanks. Yeah. You know, like sleepers and everything you could do. I feel like you would do such a good job. And plus, you know, like the ins and outs of golf, obviously, because you play it so much. You should, yeah, de- I, mean, I my, feel like you'd be so good. Yeah. I mean, my analysis hasn't been too good over the past couple of weeks. So yeah, I know that, but at least you're you're still stating facts. Even your predictions might not be correct, but at least you're giving things that are possibilities based on like prior success of other guys. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah, I think you'd be solid. Also, I think no, nah, I don't know. I just th- you should try to do something with that or so I don't know. Like I feel like you'd be good at it. I can totally see it. Maybe even like be on a podcast, you think? Yeah, or something like that. Like that'd be crazy. <laughs> I like it. Um, Speaking of podcasts, um, I saw the uh, hoodies you made for us. Yeah, no, I, those are sick. Mm-hmm, I want to make. I think whether we're gonna make like twelve or something, and I think yeah. it would be pretty. I think they would be pretty cool. We're gonna probably, probably try to put them on champion hoodies. We don't know if we're gonna do it on like custom ink yet, or try to get a local person to do it, like no inks maybe. Mm-hmm. But have you? Do you huh? like those black ones or the blue ones better? What do you think? I like he likes the blue ones, I think, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, I like the blue ones. My friend wants, he thinks it would be really cool in all black. I like all black, but I also think gray would be cool. I think that we would just, I think that we should buy like three colors and do maybe four in each or something. Okay, yeah. That'd yeah, be cool, cool, I think. Yeah, I think that's super cool. I like the design a lot mm-hmm. because. I don't really like a ton of stuff on the front of shirts, but right. um, on the back, it'd be perfect. And I feel like if you're sitting in class or something, people are going to see that. Yeah, true, true. You know what I mean? Yeah, if you're in like a big lecture hall or something and somebody's mm-hmm. sitting behind you and they see it, yeah. Yeah, but who knows if we'll ever go to class again. Yeah, facts. <laughs> I do. I my chemistry class started today, and I had to do math and chemistry today, and it was literal ass. It started today. Mm-hmm. Because I'm you taking summer, summer courses. Classes? Yeah. Oh man. Because I missed out on all winter. True. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a bummer. 
Yeah, it is a bummer. Um, so since Justin kind of fucked this up because he has to go to his grandparents' house, cause, like, how do you not know that? Yeah. It's whatever. It's whatever. Okay. But do you want to? Do you want to pick? We were talking about this yesterday. Do you want to pick one of our teams and then dive deep, like an NFL team, and then we can end with NBA or something? Sure. Do you want to just save NFL, I guess, for later, though? Because, like, yeah. it was kind of cool how we did, like, the whole division at a time. Yeah. No, yeah. You want to hop into You want to do a division? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Go pick one. Let's go. Let's go AFC North. AFC North? Okay. Actually, no, because we did an NFC team last time. So let's do the entire NFC first. Uh, let's do the NFC East. NFC East? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, what team do you want to go with first? Let's go with that one of the 49ers' biggest rivals to make it to the Super Bowl this year, the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, Dallas Cowboys are pretty stacked, dude. They are, especially on offense, it looks like. Mm -hmm. I like Michael Gallup, Mari Cooper, and then Dak Prescott is probably one of the better quarterbacks in the league. I don't think he's definitely top, I don't know, he's top 10, I think. They weren't able to finish that extension with him, though, were they? Uh, uh-uh, he's not paid yet. No. Yeah. Which so, is surprising to me. He's going to get so much money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I feel like this is one of those situations where, like, whatever amount, of, I feel like they're going to have to overpay him to keep him around because he seems like one of those. It's one of those things where, like, once you see like Patrick Mahomes obviously get a monster deal. And, like, it's just kind of the norm these days for quarterbacks to get that much. Like, Dak's going to, like, expect to get that huge payday. Mm -hmm. And then the Cowboys are going to kind of be forced between, like, overpaying him or just letting him go. And they probably are going to have to choose overpaying him because it's not like you can just get another Dak Prescott, you know? Exactly. Um, He's got all the leverage right now. Yeah, this isn't, like, breaking news or anything, but... The Cowboys kind of missed out. They really needed to pay Dak Prescott before Patrick Mahomes got paid because I feel like Patrick mm-hmm. Mahomes, obviously people are on the same level as him, but a lot of people are going to be comparing to him, you know? True, yeah. You know what I mean? And they're going to be comparing yeah. contracts, even though they're not on the same level talent-wise, obviously. But they're going to be like, if this is the max amount a team's going to pay, they're going to try to get as close to that number as they can because once something becomes possible or actually happens, that becomes the new standard. You know what I mean? Right, and these guys, like, they're, to an extent, ego-driven guys Mm -hmm. as well. And, like, success in sports is pretty much measured in dollars. And so when your contract is coming in at, like, 60% of what Patrick Mahomes is, like, all Dak Prescott is going to sort of see is that the Cowboys think he's, like, 60% of what Mahomes is, which is, like, a tough pill to swallow. Right, but you have to come to terms with, like, yeah, skill level, though. Yeah. Because no like, one's Patrick Mahomes. The closest person to Patrick Mahomes is Lamar Jackson. Mm-hmm. And Lamar's yeah, not going to get, Lamar's gonna get big money, though, but he's not yeah. going to get – no one's going to get Patty money. Won't Lamar's extension be next su- – or, yeah, next summer, like a year from now? Our rookie contract's four years. Or, yeah, but the extension – or oh, either it's an extension the of his old one. Before, yeah, the extension comes before the original contract is up. Okay, yeah, that may obviously. There, but is a rookie contract five years? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, if they want to get, if they don't like a rookie after like four years, do they just buy out their contract and release them? Yeah, or like waive them, and then them. I think with the rookie scale, it also obviously depends, like what pick you are because i'm pretty sure Mm -hmm. the rookie scale for like a first round pick might be five years but then when you get into like the later rounds it's not five years it's like a shorter amount of time obviously yeah i don't really know the nfl salary cap or the nfl cd or i don't really know the ins and outs of contracts and stuff like that it'd be interesting to like research because like i all whenever i hear stuff about (laughs) contract negotiations i always get kind of lost because i don't completely understand where the money is i mean obviously they have the money but to pay their players but when they have massive contracts like patrick mahomes and stuff and the money's not all there you know right now it's kind of it gets confusing to me yeah in the nba it's like i kind of 
try to figure that stuff out because it's like easier. But in the NFL, when there are like 32 teams and like 50 plus players on each team, it's just basically impossible to kind of keep up with all that, you know? Mm -hmm. 100%. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. Um, Yeah, I I just hate when people ask, like, you see it all. I feel like you see it all the time. Guys are asking for more money, but it's like, dude, you're not really balling out, but you're making a lot of money. Like, it's crazy, especially when people have one good season. It's like you need to actually build up a resume yeah. and prove consistency <laughs> before you get paid a ton. Is there a name you'd like to mention right now? Um, well, we already kind of mentioned like Raheem Moser. I'm trying to think. Yeah. There's been, there's yeah. just been a lot That's of. That's who I was thinking of because I remember we were talking about him. Mm-hmm. Last time when we talked about the Niners, and yeah. mm-hmm. especially the guys who are like in a situation where they can easily be replaced, it's just so yeah. dumb because you need the team more than the team needs you. Like the system that the coach has you in is making you look good, and if you look good, it means next time you're a free agent, some team is going to offer you a lot of money. So don't mess that up by demanding a trade. You know, isn't it so weird how? Um, the NFL is obviously the be- like that's the pinnacle of the sport, but you in within that you have different levels because you would th- it's just like weird to me. You would think as coaching, you would think all of it's really high level, and it obviously is. But there's obviously a difference between Kyle Shanahan and um, who's a lower level. Co- I'm not lower level. Coach. Adam Gates. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like. Yeah, that's true for, like, every sport is that there are, like, a few elite coaches. And, like, I think, like, that's a good point, too, but, because yeah. there are... That's, like, my like, point, though, is that you you might not be as good on another guy's yeah. team, so you should be more appreciative that you're in a specific organization. True, because I remember not so much now, but, like, 10 years ago, the San Antonio Spurs in the NBA had, like, a great player development system and pretty much every player they drafted like improved and looked really good in their first few seasons and then by the time their rookie scale contract was up and they hit free agency like they were getting big money offers and the Spurs just couldn't keep afford to keep all of them around and so the players would leave to go like obviously join other teams and just like never return to the same form they were on on the Spurs just because like yep. being on teams with good coaching and being on good teams just makes bad players look better than they really are. Like Draymond. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't even say it. Don't even say it. Um, but yeah, it's, but it's all, it's just such a, it's so, it's, that's so difficult though. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is, um, if you just develop a bunch of really good players and I feel like baseball's, a little bit different in the sense that it takes a little bit more time. And when you actually make it to the show, you have to stay there for a while to prove it. But in basketball, if you have like one or two good years, teams are like chomping at the bit to get you out of there. Mm-hmm. So. And in baseball too, like it feels like you always have a chance. Cause in basketball, if you fall out of the NBA, you have to go like overseas or to some like completely different, like the league to like just keep, maintaining your career but in baseball like if you like mess up for some reason and fall out of the majors you're still in like the minor league system where there are major league scouts watching you so you always have like an opportunity if you play well to immediately Mm -hmm. jump back up yeah like some sports if you mess up once you're done for yeah um one thing i wanted to ask you is do you think that especially now more than ever do you think that there's going to be a shift and you're going to see more players just skip college and go to the g league especially with pay and stuff oh yeah yeah for sure yeah definitely because i mean you've already kind of seen it this year like there have been i think four already major recruits like four guys who are in the esp and like top 50 recruits who have either left college or yeah they've all like decommitted from their college and decided to go the g league route i don't know why people didn't do this before yeah, just because it wasn't in the rules, I guess. But Oh, wait, is it new? Yeah, it's new. This is the first year that people are going to be allowed to. Oh, just because of what's going on? Or did they uh, have this preset? 
No, it's mostly just because, like, the NBA sort of saw a area where they could, I don't know, sort of just, I guess, improve their own product or, like, generate more interest in the G League and just yeah, NCAA uh, is probably not the happiest with that. No, definitely not. But what I'm kind of hoping is that this will like force the NCAA's hand and like maybe now the NCAA will be forced to start paying their guys just to compete with the NBA and the G League, you know. But That's also so interesting. Like why hasn't stuff like this happened? I mean I knew that you could go straight out of the league. They made a rule where you have to go to college for a year, but yeah it's but then also i feel like college sports don't really rely on like big names because like they don't no because like if i'm a like you've been a duck basketball fan for your entire life pretty much and i've been Mm -hmm. a beaver basketball fan for my entire life and i kind of disagree with that though yeah, but like it's like ESPN marketed the crap out of Zion, and then they do Trevor Lawrence, Joe Burrow, like whoever becomes a star. That's what the NCAA instantly profits off that because yeah, and that's facts. But I also feel like people are kind of forced into their NCAA like fandom because, like, say, like I graduate, I'm gonna well, not I haven't graduated, but I'm gonna graduate <laughs> out, so I'll probably like root for the Ducks like for the rest of my life, and like it's not gonna really matter like how whether they have like a superstar player because like superstar players in college only last okay, for like in the small picture for a community like eugene's always going to be strong for the ducks yeah i mean i guess but the big name players is what draws um rating casuals into the game which will boost like um, which b- will boost revenue for the NCAA. Like the NCAA, no matter what, is going to make money off big name players because teams obviously are going to make the players, like, I don't know, they're going to make them big names. Yes. Yeah. And I think programs, they're obviously going to develop their players into the best that they can be. And therefore, there's always going to be stars. And that's what the NCAA wants. Yeah. But I agree. But how many casual fans are going to be watching a game between like Duke and Wake Forest in like on like January 21st anyway? Like even if Zion, well, like if somebody like is on social media, they might not be a big basketball fan, but if they see Zion on social media, they're more inclined to watch probably like they don't necessarily yeah. have to be a big basketball fan. Yeah. I just think like regular the NCAA, season. like straight up, they make it a lot of money off big name players like Trevor Lawrence. Oh, oh for sure. But it's always yeah. going to be a thing. Like they're always going to be fine if, um, because all the college fan bases are obviously so loyal. So yeah. you're never going to, and you're never going to be hurting for cash per se, but it definitely helps to have big name players. But it's yeah. going to take it, it's definitely going to take a hit when there's guys that are just going to enter the G League straight away. Because mm-hmm. it's going to take more time. There's not that immediate like star power, right? You know yeah. what I mean? It'll take a, a year maybe for someone to like solidify their name. Yeah, in a lot of ways, though, I think this will be like I think the NCAA will probably respond within the next few years by just maybe biting the bullet and hopefully paying college athletes. And I know that the whole argument against that is it's going to be unfair for like kids on like the rowing team to not get paid while I But it's all them. about who pulls number. Right. Yeah, exactly. And football so, players are going to get paid more. <laughs> the, yeah. The, the higher level football. That's going to be interesting though. How are they going to divvy it up? It's probably going to be who's starting though. It's all yeah. going to be relative. If you're Trevor Lawrence, you're going to be making more cash than that third string QB. Do you think recruiting kids out of high school is just going to turn into like NFL free agency and kids will go to whichever school offers them the most money? 110 percent yeah dude do you think there'll be contract negotiations involved with the money though like you got to stay for three years and we'll guarantee you like a certain amount of cash like that'd be crazy yeah because i i think some of these schools have got to be like wealthy enough to offer a kid more money than one nfl rookie scale contract would be right wait what say that again like i'm sure alabama like maybe there maybe there'll be like a max contract that's lower than an NFL rookie contract. But if there's no like salary cap and no restrictions, 
I don't think there's anything stopping like one of these massive schools from giving a kid more than like what any NFL team would pay him in a rookie year, you know? Yeah, hundred percent. Um, also, I was going to say that the risk reward with paying college athletes out of high school is going to be, it's way crazier because at least the NFL gets the best guys filtered out and sure a guy might not work out, but a kid out of high school is completely different. Could you imagine paying them a bunch of money? Cause you always hear about five-star recu- recruits that you never hear about again, make it to the NFL. Yeah. But I mean, there are also guys who are like first round picks in the NFL and like our busts. No, no, no. That's no, that's what I'm saying. But there's oh, way yeah. more high school kids going into college than there yeah. is college going in the NFL. Oh, true. Yeah. For so sure. it's going to be crazy. I, I could definitely see something like that happening now. Yeah. But the teams like Oregon and stuff. And the, the only way that smaller level schools are going to get good players is through like family loyalty and like family ties and stuff, because the main power five schools and the top teams in each of those divisions are like Oregon's going to be able to pay however much they want for players. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's where it won't be fair in a way. I don't know. (laughs) I think that's a really interesting point though. Yeah, it'll be interesting. (laughs) It'll be interesting to see, I guess. I have no, it'll open up an entire like can of worms and entire, it'll be like a Pandora's box if they ever decide to start paying college athletes because there'll just be so many like implications we haven't never even thought of before, you know? Mm -hmm. And I feel like a lot of players would be content as long as the money went to their family or something. Like if they could, they could offer compensation to their family i feel like that would play a big role too like not not necessarily a lot of money going to the player and themselves but play uh, going to their family yeah and like let's not be naive either like most of the big recruits have been getting paid by colleges Mm -hmm. for the past like several years zion didn't he Mm -hmm. yeah zion and deandre ayton yeah i'm sure well i mean those are just the guys who got caught but like no, there's been tons under the table. Yeah, for sure. But, I don't, yeah. Yeah, it's it's it just kind of stinks because some of these kids get, get caught in such a tough position and then they get family members talking for them and influencing them and then they're just caught in the middle. Yeah. It, it, there's just so many variables that it's just so unfair. They just get – some of these kids just get straight up used and it's so sad. Yeah. It's really upsetting to see. But I just think that it would be also dope if the Power Five just broke away from the NCAA and just did their own thing. That would that would be interesting. Yeah. It would be I would I would like I've heard about it just for football, but it would be kind of cool if they just all broke away and just did their own thing and they could just pay players. Could you imagine just having a tournament between just like SEC schools and Pac-12 schools, like that'd be so sick. Like they could do whatever they want. I would miss March Madness though. <laughs> yeah, but you would be getting the best schools anyway. But I mean, okay, that's not necessarily true. Yeah, because the, the schools that like aren't the best are what makes it fun, you know, like all the upsets and stuff. Yeah, but how cool. often do they usually like make it past the Sweet 16 now? Well, that not very often. Mm-hmm. But I think that that, I th- there's just so many cool things that you could do. Yeah. I definitely wish there was more non-conference. I said that last time. Non-conference games are sick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> non-conference games are cool because they're like matchups we've never seen before. But it also, like you can't really, like you have to have certain conference matchups that you play every year, you know? Like, it would be wrong to have, like, a season where, like, Oregon didn't play Washington, you know? Yeah, yeah, like, I know you mean. Stanford. Do you want to make an announcement for Yeah, so on Sunday, we might have a UFC fighter come on named Gustavo Lopez, and I'm going to interview him. Jonah's still kind of on the fence on whether he wants to be there or not. But um, if he does, we'll, well, we'll just play it by ear, so. I'll, I'll be there. Okay. Yeah, I, might, we'll I might not be contributing much, but I'll at least be part of history, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, but besides that, we'll probably go do one on Thursday, and then my sister wants to do one with me. It's not really going to be about sports, but it'll just be kind of fun to, like, interview my sister because 
she's an interesting fellow. Cool. But yeah. All right. So later, Joe, and we'll try to figure out this mic situation. Sounds okay. good. Honestly, you. if you want, we can just make like we could do something cool where we make it clips because we had the weird beginning, you know, we're waiting for Justin. But then yeah. we, I feel like the stuff we talked about in the middle was pretty good. Yeah. It might be a shorter one because we just did the UFC and then the golf. and then. But we, we honestly could just do like a clip, like clips of it. Okay. Yeah. And or, like it could just be like a sh- or it could just be like a shorter episode. It doesn't yeah. We can just do a shorter that. episode for sure. Yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Bye bye. Have a good night. You too. And then probably Thursday and then Sunday praying to God that it actually happens. Yeah. It's going to be sick. Yes. Okay. All right. Bye bye. Bye.